selected for the nine hours battle training. Their first challenge, however, will be to convince flight instructor Brendan that they have the right stuff. And like their predecessors, they will have to do it in a Tiger Moth. Our four young pilots will begin their journey to become Spitfire pilots here at Headcorn Airfield in Kent, where they will have their piloting skills tested on exactly the plane used by many of their Battle of Britain predecessors, the Tiger Moth. They will be in the hands of flying instructor Brendan O'Brien, who will then make the tough decision which of the four pilots will go on to fly the Spitfire. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to Headcorn Airfield. The first morning's briefing. My name's Brendan O'Brien, and I'm going to be your instructor on the Tiger Moth for the next several days. Now, I think you all know why you're here, but just to recap, OK? You're all going to fly with me on the Tiger Moth over the next few days, yeah? Two of you, then, will be selected to go on to fly the Spitfire. Out of those two, one will be selected to do advanced flying training and aerobatics on the Spitfire. At the end of that time, that person will have a very good idea of what it was like to be a young fighter pilot during World War II. The first to clamber into the cockpit is Christian. The Tiger Moth made an excellent basic training aircraft during the 30s, as it is said to be easy to fly, but hard to fly well. You really get this feeling of smell and like the old smell. It's just like being back in 1940s. And the airport here where we're at now is such an old-fashioned airport. Um, you might, if you shut your eyes, you might as well be back in the 1940s. Fuel on. Fuel on. Throttle set. Throttle set. Contact. Contact. It's sort of always been in the family, really. My granddad uh, flew uh, Spitfires. So I'd go to their house and I'd see pictures of him by aircraft on the walls. So it was always there from a young age. And then as I got older, I got involved with the uh, training corps and uh, sort of got a bit, little bit more flying there to see what it's like. And the more I found out about it, the, the more enthused I've been to carry on, really. Yeah, I used to read uh, a lot of history books about the First World War and the Second World War, and uh, things like Biggles books and all the old, old stories about pilots and the, uh, sort of the olden times flying, like tiger moths, obviously, and uh, you know, with camels and things like that. I got really interested in it, um, and then obviously went on and joined the Air Force later on in life. Many Battle of Britain pilots earned their wings on Tiger Moths before moving on to advanced trainers and then Spitfires or Hurricanes. It's all that a, an elementary trainer should be, but it was a, a nice aircraft to fly, and aerobatic, and uh, because they had so much lift that they bounced about the sky, so that if you're doing formation flying, it's much harder to, to keep position in a formation. Overall, I'd, I'd give it eight out of 10, I'd say. The Tiger Moth will give Brendan a clear idea of each of our pilots' flying abilities, whilst giving them a vivid first impression of the realities of 1930s RAF fighter pilot training. Dear old boy, you can side slip down, yes? OK. Whoa, 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 shit. Sorry. <laughs> no, a little bit more subtly, like that, and you're about to flick into the ground, mate, OK? okay? Just ten years before the outbreak of war, the RAF's frontline fighters weren't that different from the Tiger Moth. In 1929, the best the RAF had to offer was the Bristol Bulldog, a lightly armed biplane capable of just 174 miles per hour. But with Germany starting to rearm, it became alarmingly clear this would have to change. The middle of the 1930s saw a revolution in the design of fighter aircraft, uh, a move away from a biplane that was made of, of wood and doped fabric to an all-metal monoplane. And the prime reason for that was the need for speed. In 1930, the Air Ministry rose to the threat, calling for a fighter capable of 250 miles per hour and carrying four machine guns. Aircraft designers considered this virtually impossible, and even the pilots had their misgivings. 
there was an awful bias against monoplanes. You know, they reckon without a top wing bolted to a bottom wing, the wings would fall off. The speed of them uh, was perceived initially by a lot of people as being potentially beyond the control of the ordinary human being. Uh, and it was thought that they were so fast that they would only be able to make one quick pass um, and then they'd be gone. There were those who believed that the, the manoeuvrability uh, and flexibility of the biplane uh, was such um, that it should be maintained um, for, for effectively dogfighting purposes. Christian has survived his first flight in the Tiger Moth and is beginning to see why generations of pilots think so highly of them. How was your first flight in the Tiger Moth? i tell you what, absolutely brilliant. It's a different world up there. There's so much better visibil visibility and it's so responsive. And so you need so much better coordination with the rudders and they stick on this as you would do. And it's not very forgiving, so you've got to be really in, um, really in tune with the rudder and the ailerons. But it's absolutely brilliant. Now he set the standard, it's up to the others to impress Brendan. Okay, you have control. I have control. Lower your nose. Lower the nose. Yep. Don't rush. And rolling. Keep it going, keep it going. Relax on the runners. That was fine. You'd have been absolutely perfect. There. It's not my pressure. Just relax, do the same thing without all the aggression and the aggressive pulling in. Let me go, pull and roll. That's it. Keep going, keep going. And roll now. That's the boy. Much better. Good feet too. Well done. Good. Don't stop me, cow. Good. Not too hard, bit too hard. Okay. Bit too hard. But just a bit hard okay. and aggressive. Be smooth. Okay, okay, okay. Make love to the sky. Do not shag it. <laughs> It was really good. I mean, it, it flies so much different to the aircraft uh, that I've been used to flying. Uh, but it's amazing. It's very, very uh, sensitive on the uh, controls, especially on the uh, sort of uh, elevator, especially. But uh, oh, it's amazing with the wind in your face uh, compared to sort of a closed cockpit. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The whole experience was really good. I didn't think I fired particularly well. Um, I struggled to, to get the attitude right, so I was constantly chasing things. but. But as an experience, it was excellent. It was really, really good. My landing was a bit heavy, certainly. Um, the turns to start off with, I was uh, wobbling all over the place, but later on I started to get the hang of it and started to get it turning coordinated turns, which was, uh, looked a lot better and felt, felt right. They may have been fun to fly, but it was clear the next air war would not be decided with biplanes. But monoplanes wouldn't work without much more power. The breakthrough came when Rolls-Royce created an engineering masterpiece, the Merlin. This 24-litre beast created over 1,000 horsepower and opened up exciting new possibilities for aircraft designers. When the Air Ministry put out a specification for a new low-wing monoplane fighter, the first person to take it up was Sidney Cam, the chief designer for Hawkers. Cam had produced most of the most successful aircraft then in service in the RF, both light bombers and fighters. And what he did was to take the basic design of the Hawker Fury and turn it into a monoplane. And the result of this, known first of all as the Fury monoplane, became the Hurricane. And the Hurricane was in a sense a halfway house. The wings were metal, the forward fuselage was metal, but from the middle of the cockpit back, it was actually constructed on wooden slats covered in fabric again. The Hurricane's hybrid approach allowed it to break the magical 300 miles per hour barrier and to carry not just four machine guns, but eight. At last, the RAF hoped it had a plane capable of facing the German menace. As a bomber destroyer, it was very effective indeed. Um, it was easy to fly uh, and it could operate from quite rough uh, airstrips. At the time, in late 1935, it was the fastest thing in the sky. And for about nine months, it captured the imagination of every English schoolboy who saw these things zipping about overhead until, unfortunately,